Hi, my name is Mark Fallone. I'm Chief Patent Counsel for the Americas at IBM, and you're listening to IP Fridays. Hello, and welcome to this episode of IP Fridays. Our names are Ken Suzanne and Rolf Clayson, and this is the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. It does not matter where you are from, in-house or private practice, novice or expert. We will help you stay up to date with current topics in the fields of trademarks, patents, design and copyright, discover useful tools, and much more. Welcome to episode 146 of IP Fridays. Today's interview guest is Mark Vallone. He is the Chief Patent Counsel of the Americas at IBM, and we talk about patents. But before we jump into the interview, I have news for you. The European Patent Office has revoked a COVID patent of Moderna after opposition proceedings initiated by BioNTech. Moderna already stated that they will file an appeal against this decision in the opposition. In the UK, the English High Court has overturned an earlier decision of the UK Patent Office finding the training of artificial neural networks and the artificial neural ne networks themselves patentable. The Unified Patent Court introduces a functionality called My Legal Team, which makes it easier for teams to work on the same case, so several team members can now log into the same case for the same party. And now let's jump into the interview with Mark Vallone. Today's guest is Mark Vallone. If you don't know Mark Vallone, he is the Chief Patent Counsel Americas at IBM. And he joined IBM in 1998 and had some other positions in between, but then rejoined IBM in 2010 and is with IBM since then. So thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Ralph. Glad to be here today. Yeah, so uh, you are involved with all the patent matters uh, of IBM, of course, uh, focus on Americas, but maybe we, I'm allowed to also ask you some questions about like international strategies and so on. So um, maybe the first obvious thing that came to my mind, I'm quite curious about your patent strategy at IBM. Usually IBM had been leading the rankings of the patent, the most active patent filer rankings for a long time, 28 years or so. And then in 2022, last year, uh, there was a sharp decline of granted US patents. Um, what is the backstory on this? What is behind this? And did you change your filing strategy? And does it also have implications on your international patenting activity? Yeah, sure, Ralph. Thanks for the question. So uh, IBM had decided back in 2020 that we would no longer pursue a goal of numeric patent leadership. And, and it took a while to, for that to actually play out. So you'll, you'll notice in, in 2021, we still issued about 8,700 U.S. patents, and in 2022, about 4,400. So it, it took a bit for that to um, actually play out in the, in the granting numbers. Um, but a lot of that, the, the decision for that is just because IBM's innovation model has changed over time and our mixture of technology has changed over time. So if you look back when patent leadership started in 1993, IBM was uh, much more of a hardware company at that time, much more based on proprietary innovation where a heavy patent strategy um, really made a lot of sense. And of course, in a technology company, things changed tremendously in about 30 years over time. Uh, we're much more uh, involved in software and consulting. Uh, we still have a good hardware business, but we have a really heavy concentration on software and consulting. Our innovation model has changed. We rely a lot more on open source software, um, not only as a, as, a, as a consumer, but also as a, a, as a producer of, of open source software. And our innovation model has changed in the way we collaborate. So as time goes on, you see more and more open collaboration even outside of the company where, where folks are, are participating in communities and help try to solve problems together. Um, and so against that backdrop, you really need to have a more holistic uh, IP strategy um, rather than necessarily going for, for leadership numbers. So, so a couple of good examples I'll give you are, you know, the first one with respect to our, our quantum technology, right? So quantum computing is, is, is one of the hot technologies right now. Um, and with quantum hardware, we're certainly 
um, patenting. There's trade secret aspects to that. You know, there's aspects of that that are very uh, difficult to discover from an infringement perspective. So uh, there's a, a good mix of, of trade secret and patent there. But also on the software side, we have a, a, an open source uh, component to that called QuizKit, which is our development, uh, our, our SDK uh, for Quantum, which helps drive um, adoption of that, uh, that platform so that people can experiment with it, right? Um, so with a mixture of trade secret uh, uh, aspects, patent aspects, open source aspects, which you're not necessarily going to patent, you really need a much more holistic strategy. Same sort of goes uh, with our with our cloud strategy, right? We have an open hybrid cloud platform built on Red Hat OpenShift to allow uh, customers to have uh, on-prem components, components that are in public cloud and shift back and forth. Um, so not necessarily all built on proprietary technology. So lots of changes there in terms of how we innovate um, and had to evolve our patent strategy because of that. Um, she asked about the international co um, component as well. Well, I'll say on the U.S. side and the, on the international side, um, it's much heavy focus on patenting our best inventions by technology, right? And it, so that's going to be consistent with how we do things in the U.S. and internationally, um, being much more selective, but again, being much more holistic about what we're looking at in terms of how are we going to protect the IP that comes out of this product, this technology, et cetera. Yeah, so uh, as most of your inventions are uh, originated in the US, probably they first land on your table, on your colleagues' tables, and then you decide um, where to go internationally, probably, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, uh, quite honestly, we're, we're, we're very global. So uh, we do have a, a large proportion of our inventions that originate from outside of the U.S. as well. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very diverse inven inventor community. Right. Yeah, I, I know you have also big research facilities in Switzerland and everywhere in the world, like in India and right. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have uh, uh, <laughs> research facilities across the globe. Correct. Right, right. So um, one question came to my mind, um, like a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court issued a decision called Alice. Um, and some people thought like now all IT patents are dead, <laughs> but maybe not so. Um, a, a couple of decisions came later and clarified the situation a little bit. But is it possible that um, this decline also had to do with uh, these decisions with patent eligibility? That you decided maybe to not to file patents for certain things anymore? Uh, no, the the Alice decision really didn't play into our our strategy to not pursue U.S. patent leadership anymore. Although you you are correct that Alice and excuse me, some of the subsequent decisions really did have an impact in the in the software space, particularly around AI, data analytics, and e-commerce technologies and. Of course, those are technologies that IBM is very active in, um, but I'd say IBM, like many other companies, are, are would love to see uh, clarity around subject matter eligibility in the U.S., but uh, that case law was not part of the uh, impetus behind the change of patent strategy. Yeah, so how do you see the topic of patent eligibility evolving in the U.S.? Can you briefly summarize what you see as the most important current developments and uh, your, your perspective um, as IBM, like from a viewpoint of IBM? And is this what currently happens, is that good or bad for the patent system in general? What do you think? Sure. So... Um... Where, where, where do I start? <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it, some of the challenges right now are, are you'll see in the U.S. that the subject matter eligibility test that the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office uses is somewhat different than the test that the federal courts use. Um, and, and that is uh, a challenge when you go to enforce. In fact, uh, the district courts and federal courts in the U.S. have expressly declined to follow the U.S. PTO's uh, test, so that makes things a bit challenging. Um, neither of those tests define what an abstract idea actually is, so we're, we're in this uh, state where uh, we are... Uh, there's just no certainty around the decisions. You, your the courts are trying to, and the USPTO are trying to determine whether claims are directed to an abstract idea without a definition of what that means, um, <laughs> which leads to inconsistent outcomes. Um, the Supreme Court uh, in the U.S. is really not uh, uh, interested in hearing subject matter eligibility cases at this point. Since the Alice decision came out, they've uh, declined petitions for cert about 60 times. Um, 
it, recently they've been asking for the solicitor general's view with respect to certain cases, American Axel, the David Trop case and interactive wearables. Uh, this, each time the, the solicitor general came back and advised the Supreme Court, this would be a good, good case to hear and provide some clarity around subject debt matter eligibility. And then the Supreme Court denied the petition for cert anyway. Um, so we still don't have clarity from the court. So it seems like they're really not interested um, in trying to clear that up at this point. Um, the last two years, we've had uh, legislation introduced into the, the Senate called the Patent Eligibility Restoration Act. Uh, the 2023 version differs a bit from the 2022 version. Um, but that's, um, uh, I think, a good legislative attempt to provide some clarity around subject matter eligibility. We understand that's going to be probably a long road. Uh, won't go through in 2023, maybe not 2024, 2025. Um, but right now is probably our, our best chance at clarifying subject matter eligibility in the U.S. Um, so hopefully we start to gain some traction with that. But as to your question as to whether you know the, the status quo is good or bad for the patent system, um, it, I it's most certainly bad. Um, it lacks the certainty that is required for investing in businesses to help grow the economy. Um, because even with a granted, granted patent in various areas of science and technology, there's no certainty as to whether that patent is valid. It could be asserted to exclude others. Um, at the same time, the U.S. patent system is starting to lag behind that of other countries that have broader eligibility provisions. Um, so certainly we would like to see uh, more certainty in this area and help um, help. Uh, protect that investment that folks would make in, in, in companies to help grow, grow the economy. Yeah, that decision, uh, that, that discussion reminds me a little bit of the European discussion where um, the European Patent Office also refuses to say what is technical and what is not technical. Uh, we have the question if there is a technical contribution or if the invention solves a technical problem and you say you currently have the question, is it um, an abstract idea or not, uh, basically. Uh, so, yeah, the legislation, they con they refuse to give more clear um, definitions and it's difficult. Um, some of the decisions in the US, they also try to address technicality to some degree. But um, my understanding is that um, it's currently not a requirement that something needs to be technical or solve a technical problem, right? Right, so that's not a that's not a requirement by statute. It's it's not a requirement in the case law. You certainly have a a much better path toward eligibility the more technical uh, your invention is, and and describing your invention as a technical solution to a technical problem is helpful, but not a requirement. Right. Yeah. So um, one other question that came to mind, especially in view of IBM and uh, all the AI tools that come up uh, like ChatGPT and so on, like um, what in your opinion are the benefits uh, of uh, or implications uh, of using generative AI at the various stages of the patenting process? So can the inventor be AI? And of course, the courts already had made some decisions, but um, yeah, what, what does that what what is the influence on the inventing on the patenting process and the invention process um that ai is playing in the future what do you think yeah that's a great question ralph i think there's such great promise in in, in ai and um i think we're all learning to embrace it where it makes sense and helping to develop it where it still needs some more work to do. In terms of inventing, you're right. Uh, you know, the, a lot of the courts have had their say on that already. And in the US, AI is not recognized as an inventor. Um, but we also see it as a, 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 an IBM in particular sees it as a, as a tool that can help inventors, but not an inventor in and of itself. In terms of AI as, as a tool throughout the patent process, um, look, I think there's some really great benefits that it's showing or, or, or promises that it's showing. One is, you know, especially with with tools like Chad GPT can help you generate a, a specification r really quickly. And of course, we're always under time and cost pressures to, to try to you know develop our, our patent applications as, as quickly as we can. Um, it can dra draft a robust uh, specification and and generates natural text that a human might write. It sounds very much like a, like a person wrote it. Um, but of course, there are some considerations that we need to be mindful of. Um, in particular, is 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 the output, um, right? ChatGPT in and of itself was trained on using data from the internet through about 2021, and you always have to have that human component involved to make sure that the output is accurate. You've probably seen in the U.S. we had a, a 
a, a court case where a, an attorney submitted a brief to a court without uh, proofreading it, and it had some some hallucinations in it, some fake case citations, and, and that attorney was fined five thousand dollars by the judge. So you can't take the human component out of it. You always have to proofread the output um, that comes out of it. The other thing you have to be careful of is, and we already talked about inventorship, right? Um, if uh, if content, while we don't recognize AI as an inventor, we also don't want to claim subject matter that didn't come from our inventors. So you need to be very careful in terms of what you end up claiming uh, when you're using a generative AI uh, tool to generate a patent application. Other things that stand out to be really important are, are confidentiality, right? So if if we were using chat GPT, which is a third party tool without the proper confidentiality provisions, is that a problem in absolute novelty jurisdictions outside of the US? Does it start the grace period in the US? You need to be very careful when reviewing the terms of these tools to make sure you don't have an issue there. You also need to you know, uh, be concerned about export type issues, right? So where are the servers hosting this, uh, this software located? Are they outside of the US? Are they in the US? Because you don't wanna have you know, certainly don't want to have an export issue there. So there are some things you need to be very mindful of. Um, but again, I think it's got great promise and I'm, I'm excited to see where, where it goes from here. Right. IBM was probably one of the first players with a um, publicly available AI system, Watson, right? Um, and um, that is already um, around for a long time and is very powerful uh, currently, maybe more powerful than just uh, text generative AI like ChatGPT. Um, are you using this uh, internally, like your own, like uh, your own AI tools? <laughs> We're very much encouraged to use our own AI tools internally. We have <laughs> we have a, 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 a rather new um, generative AI product that's called Watson X. You may have may have heard of that. Um, and we're really working on building out internal uh, solutions built on Watson X and, and trying to work on obviously gaining uh, adoption externally as well. So absolutely, we're looking at it across the board for internal use and how we can best leverage it, including in our IP operations, for sure. Yes. Um, now I want to turn to some other very different topic. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about your licensing and litigation strategy. In the mid-90s, uh, when Lou Gerstner took over IBM, he he really affected a big dramatic turnaround of IBM, steering away from the selling mainframe computers and generating over 1 billion US dollars very shortly thereafter in revenue from patent license fees. And over the past two decades, um, the income from license fees uh, was around 1 billion US dollars per year, if I understand correctly. And uh, only the last three years, we saw a little drop in license revenues. And is that is that drop in license revenues like um, a result of your shift in the patenting strategy or is there other, are there other reasons? Well, as, as I, I mentioned earlier, the shift in patent strategy really uh, was a decision that was made in 2020. So, so this would really be too early for that patent strategy to play out and what you're seeing in terms of, of licensing right. numbers. Um, but I will say, um, the the numbers that you see are, are IP licensing numbers in general, not necessarily um, patent licensing income. Oh, right? I see. So so that's that's uh, part of what you're seeing as well. Um, but I'll also say there's certainly headwinds that that you see in the patent licensing area. And as IBM's business has shifted more towards software, and you see some of these uh, you know areas affecting software in particular, there's certainly headwinds there. Um, uh, a couple that I can mention are, you know, since uh, the Supreme Court's eBay decision in 2006, it's very hard to get an injunction in patent infringement suits. That makes licensing a bit more difficult or a lot more difficult. Um, the Patent Trial and, and, and Appeal Board uh, was created as part of the America Invents Act as an alternative to district court litigation. And uh, they, they tend to have a high rate of invalidity uh, findings at the PTAB. Uh, that's another headwind. Then, of course, we've already talked about Alice, which um, has a particular impact in software technologies. Again, a lot, a lot around AI, uh, data analytics, e-commerce, and such. So that's another headwind. And, you know, when you have, uh, you know, potential licensees as you're looking at against this backdrop, some decide it's less expensive for them to infringe and take their chances that, you know, the patent might be found invalid under any of these other areas. And, and with it being difficult to get an injunction enforcement can be very difficult. Um, so certainly headwinds that, that, that we're facing software companies in general face the same ones. Um, so that, you know, can tend to have an impact as well. You just mentioned the PTAP. If I can ask you a little follow-up question on that, um, the PTAP has received a lot of criticism from a lot of um, people in the patenting and, the, and among the patent professionals in the past years. 
Um, and and some people really like the PTAP, <laughs> of course, because um, well, um, it's easier to or less expensive to uh, attack patterns, and maybe then only really enforceable patterns survive. That's the, that's the viewpoint of of one of the side. So. Um, yeah, so what is your view? Like, um, are the, is the PTAP overdoing it a little bit? <laughs> or is that okay? So so that only the really strong patterns survive? Or um, what, what is your view, like, uh, of the of the PTAP at the moment? Like, well, certainly, certainly we were, were a proponent of, of strong patents. Um, but, you know, with, with PTAP and validity rates being what they are, I think we want to do everything we can to make sure that what's coming out of the USPTO in the first instance is the best quality as possible, right? So are they using the best tools at their disposal? Are they finding the best prior art? Um, are they getting uh, good, good uh, you know, specifications and, and, and good claims um, and examining them thoroughly? Um, I think that's really what we want to make sure we're focusing on, and then we don't put a, the PTAB in a situation where they're finding there's a, a lot of you know patents that are coming out of the PTO in the first instance that are invalid. So we want to do everything we can to support the PTO and and helping to ensure that it's granting you know quality patents in the first instance. Yeah. Okay. So talking about patent litigation, you also mentioned that topic already. Um, mm -hmm. What are your like IBM's most popular venues when you sue other parties for patent infringement? Uh, do you also consider Germany or probably the newly established Unified Patent Court that just opened the doors in June? Uh, what, mm -hmm. what venues do you consider when first filing, and where do you where do you carry out your trials, um, like following up the first? Um, filing of a patent litigation lawsuit. Uh, I, I guess I should start that by saying we hope to not have to pick a venue at all. IBM doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't file a lot of infringement litigation. We much prefer to re reach a, a, a business resolution with other parties, and especially, um, uh, you know, we find value in, in taking a license from the other party as well, um, and 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 cross licensing. Um, I think maybe we filed. Uh, 20 or just north of, of 20 patent infringement suits as a, as a plaintiff since 2008. So, so not very heavy in the, in the litigation space and preference for, you know, um, business resolutions. But when we do, I can say, you know, right now we have cases going in the central district of California. We have a case going in the district of Delaware um, right now. And there's, there's a lot of factors that play into that, including, you know, first, what jurisdiction do you have patents in? Where are the defendants located? Where are they earning the revenue from the infringing activity? So there's a lot of considerations that go into that. You asked about Germany. That's certainly an attractive venue. Um, I talked earlier about injunctions. It's even easier to get an injunction in Germany than it certainly is in the United States. Um, and with respect to the UPC, you know, certainly if our litigation team uh, uh, would consider the UP the Unified Patent Court if they thought that was the best ven uh, best venue in a particular case. Um, having haven't been there yet, but um, you know certainly wouldn't take that off the table. Yeah, so um, that's really surprising for me to see that you only filed very a small a, f a small number of patent litigation cases or patent infringement cases over the last year. So uh, that's very surprising to me. So um, yeah. Uh, that's a good sign. So, so you you reach uh, you can avoid that and reach um, solutions outside the courts, and um, that maybe shows that uh, when Lou Gerstner started to to focus on patent licensing uh, and license income, that uh, you are a master in this, uh, convincing other parties to take a license or maybe even uh, discuss cross licensing and so on, as you mentioned, right? Oh, yeah, those discussions can take a long time. So they don't always, you know, take a right. day, take a month, right? They can take sometimes years. But if it comes to it, you know, we're, we'll defend our, our our patent rights in court if we have to. But you know, as I said, we we would, the, the the company does work hard at at, at uh, business resolutions to those issues. Yeah. So now we have covered a lot of ground, <laughs> yep. and uh, from filing strategy to litigation, license fees, and AI. So thank you so much. Uh, but in the end, I want to ask you, um, like, what, in your opinion, are the three most important lessons that you learned in your uh, years at IBM? Um, you joined in '98, so you you know IBM for a long time, and as in the patent field since 2010 for the last 13 years. And what can other IP professionals in similar positions uh, like yours maybe learn from your experience? And um, 
And maybe also you can uh, elaborate a little of, uh, on your biggest challenges uh, in your current job as a P uh, chief patent counsel at IBM. Like, what, what are you facing at the moment? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. I guess we'll we'll start with the three three most important lessons that I, I've learned in, in in my time at IBM, which is, has spanned you know being an attorney in the IP law area and also being a software engineer. Um, so three things I'd say. The first one is uh, feedback is a gift that we should be generous in giving, thankful in receiving, and persistent in requesting. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. and and it's, feedback has been a, a tremendous part of helping me grow my own career. I. I um, I'm grateful to hear, you know, not just the positive things and things I'm doing well, but things that I can improve on to, to help me grow. Um, I'm glad to exchange feedback, especially with others that I'm meeting in this role from outside of the company and, you know, things that, uh, you know, we can talk about and help each other improve and certainly internally helping to grow my team, especially. Um, it's been a really key component of how we perform at IBM and, um, uh, we're trying to create that culture where um, sharing feedback helps us all grow. So I think that one's been tremendously important um, to me. Um, I think another one, uh, our, our former CEO, Ginny Rometty, used to say this one quite a bit. Uh, and that's, you, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable if you want to grow in your career. Um, <laughs> so, you know, every time I've taken on a new role, there is that, that, that period of time. And it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily go away. There are things that are going to make you uncomfortable and how you, how you persevere through that, I think really says a, a lot about how you can perform, especially as a leader. Um, it, it takes quite a bit of humility, right? When you come into a new leadership role and you want to show your clients and your peers, yes, I know this, I've got it. I can handle this just fine. But, you know, you have to sometimes put that pride aside that you're not going to know the answer to every single question that comes up. And it's okay to ask questions. It's not a sign of weakness as a leader. In fact, it's a sign of maturity as a leader. Um, so get comfortable being uncomfortable. And the last one, it may be a bit cliche, um, but I IBM's motto for since its inception has has been one word, and that's that's think, right? So at IBM, we're, we're, we're creative problem solvers. And just because we've always done something one way is not a reason to keep doing it that way if there's something better out there. Um, we have a, a saying in IBM called, we treasure our wild ducks, right? So even sometimes the most wild idea that might seem like it won't go anywhere is the idea that ends up being exactly what you need at that time. Um, and so I think having that mindset and listening to all ideas that, that come out has really helped uh, helped us as a company, helped helped me as a, as a practitioner and helped the departments that I've led. That, that was really insightful. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> and it's also, especially that, that helps me also to grow, <laughs> to get this, uh, these ideas from you. Um, so I'm very grateful that you shared these three points um, that you learned, uh, the lessons that you learned. And now, now turning to the challenges that you have, what, what are your current challenges uh, as your, in your job as chief patent counsel at IBM? Sure. I, so I think, you know, one of the big ones is, you know, I, IBM was U.S. patent leader for 29 straight years. And and uh, so you saw, you know, we were second in the rankings last year. But there, there's a culture that developed around that. Right. And it, and it was a good culture, I would say. Inventors were very eager to submit invention disclosures, very excited about their ideas. Um we had been used to operating certain ways and how we evaluate those inventions and, and how we go forward for patenting. And, and 29 years of that practice doesn't just turn on a dime. Um, we all need to, uh, you know, embrace the new strategy. And I think we've done really well at that, you know, but certainly I would say, you know, when, when you don't go forward on, on as many ideas and you're being very selective, as I mentioned earlier, best inventions by technology, that's something that takes our inventor community and our company for it to, you know, getting used to, right. And so the challenges that come out of that, um, are, you know, are there, I think we're, we're, we're turning the corner on them, but that is a, a, a culture that was ingrained for so long that it, it takes a while to break through all of that. So I would say that some sort of my, the biggest challenges, uh, that I face right now, I think in one way or another, uh, quite a few of them stem from, from that culture change. Yeah. I understand that that is tough to tough to move ahead now um, after this long time of being the champion, basically. <laughs> but yeah, and, and, yeah, and the mindset that developed around that and so on, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, well, it has been a really great interview. I'm very grateful for your time and um, for being on this show. Um, thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, Ralph. Pleasure to be here. That's it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please show us your love by visiting ipfridays.com slash love and tweet a link to this show. We would be so grateful if you would do that. It would help us out to get the word out. Also, please subscribe to our podcast at ipfridays.com or on iTunes or Stitcher.com. If you have a question or want to be featured in one of the upcoming episodes, please send us your feedback at ipfridays.com slash feedback. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can go to ipfridays.com slash iTunes and it will take you right to the correct page on iTunes. If you want to get mentioned on this podcast or even have comments within the next episode, please leave us your voicemail at ipfridays.com slash voicemail. You have been listening to an episode of IP Fridays. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by their respective law firms. None of the content should be considered legal advice. The IP Fridays podcast should not be construed as legal advice or legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only, and you are urged to consult your own lawyer on any specific legal questions. As always, consult a lawyer or patent or trademark attorney. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.